When designing control system, you need to determine your navigation strategy. We can break this down further into the organizational structure of the screens in your system. Here are examples of two different types of navigation strategies. Broad and shallow starts with the home screen, which you can then navigate to every other screen. This is useful when you have a lot of overarching categories, but with the, only a few pieces of information in each, as a strategy requires fewer clicks and allows users to see all options at one time. Narrow and deep limits the options from the home screen and allows you to dig further down depending on the action taking place. This strategy is useful when you only have a few categories, but each one contains a lot of information, especially for a workflow with multiple steps. Now let's zoom into one of those screens themselves to discuss layout. Picking a layout is a step that can, that can be easy to gloss over, but it's integral for users who will be constantly interacting with the HMI. As you can see in the graphic, the screen is broken into home link, navigation links, system information, content title, and content. But how this is all presented can have a ripple effect on how useful any of this information is. So let's take a closer look at a few of these components. The top header is ideal for primary navigation because thanks to years of web use, we intuitively look at the top of the screen. This placement also reduces confusion by separating the page's content from the navigation. Keep in mind that a horizontal navigation does restrict the number of links you can include, so it may be better suited for a narrow and deep structure. For more complex navigational systems, a secondary top header may be useful. It has the same advantages and disadvantages as the primary header, but also uh, but allows for more options if the horizontal layout leaves you feeling a little stifled. Side navigation is frequently combined with one or more top headers to assist with more complex navigation. It's especially effective if there are multiple linking objects as the vertical structure naturally lends itself to scrolling and doesn't limit you to the dimensions of the window. Tabs are also a great navigational choice for large applications because they are so intuitive. It's easy for operators to recognize that they're looking at different information when they click a new tab. This setup allows you to efficiently display content by splitting it across multiple tabs. Now let's take a, a look at some examples of this in actual HMIs. So here's an example of an HMI where this was just basically one screen that we started with. There was no top navigational header. There was no left navigation pane. Uh, but within this, there was the ability to navigate. You can click on things and um, you know, go to different areas uh, or look at different lines. But by looking at this screen, it's very hard to kind of understand what that navigation is and, and how I should be interacting with it, or if there's just more information that we should be looking at. So if we apply some of the techniques uh, by leveraging these the, the proper headers and location of this content, we can get something like this. For here, you can see it's clear at the very top what this the page we're looking at is. We can see that there are uh, tabs that we're using here to be able to go to and navigate to different areas looking at the line state, OE by area, the skid load count. And then over on the right-hand side with the drop-down list, we can see that we can choose a different line here. But it's very, very clear to the user how they interact and how they would leverage this. Now, we're going to go through many more techniques in UI UX, but you also see that we uh, fix a couple of other issues in terms of use of color and, and placement of these objects. But uh, it could be a drastic improvement. I mean, simple little... Uh, techniques can make the experience of a user for the user much more enjoyable. Now, our demo project at demo.inductiveautomation.com leverages the uh, the navigation pane on the left, and this one has more of a, a deeper structure, as we can go explore different features of Ignition with that. Um, and this is also really perfect for mobile responsive design, where if I go to a phone or tablet, of course, that menu can be collapsed, can be hidden, and then I can bring it out with the hamburger icon. I'm sure a lot of people are familiar with those kinds of navigational strategies. So it's really, really important to kind of get the navigation set properly at the beginning. Now, once we have that in place, the second thing to look at is understanding cognitive load. So what is that? Cognitive load describes the effort required to create a mental map of how a system works. The human brain can only process so much information at one time. 
So you need to focus on what's important and get rid of extraneous information. One of the main ways to accomplish that is by removing visual clutter. This means getting rid of any visual elements that don't add critical information. Just looking at this slide, your eyes immediately jump to the words, remove visual clutter. That's the same concept you wanna be thinking about when designing your application. You're guiding the user's eye. Using alignments and grids seems straightforward, but it really makes a huge difference. When elements are aligned, it's far easier to visually understand how they're related. Grids add rhythm and order, creating a set of visual rules that form the backbone of your interface, introducing uniformity and familiarity. That way, even if a user hasn't seen a certain screen before, they'll be able to anticipate where to find navigation, data, and imagery. This goes back to the same principle of looking at the top of the screen to find the navigation bar. People today read more words each day than any other point in history, but the truth is that we don't actually read most of the time. We scan, our eyes jump around from element to element looking for the right information. To optimize for this behavior, you wanna do a couple of things. Make sure that your information is organized left to right, top to bottom. And for this example, we're assuming English. Try and use short phrases or bullet points, short phrases or bullet points, and wrap up your data under a meaningful subheadline. Limit your text to two or three fonts or font variations, like a color change, making something bold or italic. Too many variations feel distracting, but when you limit your variations, you have an interface that feels more cohesive. There's more rhythm, and you maintain that impact. Also consider pairing icons with your text. Icons act as a visual break, but be careful. You want to make sure your icons are simple and easy to read and that you always pair them with text because not everyone interprets icons the same. And leveraging flat icons is certainly much better than leveraging more 3D or colorful icons. Continue, continuing with the icons idea, being descriptive with errors. Icons won't cut it on their own. Specificity is always appreciated when it comes to finding out what needs to be fixed. Finally, keep all text left aligned. The last point we'll cover for cognitive load is the idea of consistency. Consistent UIs match user ex expectations and make it easier for them to interact faster and more accurately. Make sure that your imagery looks like it belongs together. You'll end up with an interface that works better and looks better too. Make sure to stay consistent with your terminology. If two buttons have the same action, use the same term. Having different words for the same action can be very confusing. Your aim is to make sure the interface is intuitive. Lastly, when adding elements, don't ignore the visual rules that you've created for your layout. Reuse them. It'll make your life easier and your, and your users' lives easier as well. Now let's see how cognitive load works with a few examples. Here's our first example. On the left, um, we, we didn't necessarily use a, a grid to, uh, you know, grids properly or, or kind of break up the, the data into different sections. We also had very different kinds of use of uh, fonts and font variations. And as you can see, you know, at the top with where it says product loaded and the actual product, there's no distinction between the actual title and the data of that. And uh, there's all, all different kinds of colors that are useful here and uh, used when, this, when, uh, when using it. Plus there are visual elements that don't really add much to the actual meaning of the data and how critical that information is. On the right, you can see that now we've leveraged the idea of having a very clear at the top, you know, a, a separation of what the header is and what, the, what, we're, what we're talking about. We've organized into a, a grid format. Very easy for our eye to move around and see what's happening. The use of color is really important here. We're very consistent with that use of color and the fonts. And you can see the font variations that let us know what's titles and what's data. And we're consistent with that throughout the entirety of that. So it's really important to leverage these techniques. The second example here is another one where it's really about re, uh, with a redesign is removing a lot of the, that visual clutter. And again, being very consistent with how we do things. As you can see with this one, we are definitely using icons with uh, various actions and, and buttons, and, uh, but we're doing it in a very consistent way. So hopefully you can see with, with using these techniques, it can make a huge impact. And just do that throughout the entirety of your application.